On Tech News Today, we've got early details on Google's Internet of Things version of Android. Plus, Apple's working on a new app called Home. We'll tell you all about it. And we'll introduce you to a social network for smart nerds. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, May 21st, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Braintree. If you're working on a mobile app and searching for a simple payment solution, check out Braintree. This one simple integration you can offer your customers every way to pay. To learn more and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee-free, go to braintreepayments.com slash TNT. Tech News Today is a show where we talk about, yeah, it's a show, where we talk about the news, with the journalists who reported, welcome to the show. My name is Mike Elgin, and our co-anchor today, I'm pleased to report, is Recode reporter Kurt Wagner. How are you doing, Kurt? Hey, uh, good morning, Mike. I'm so glad you're here now. You know, you and I were uh, briefly talking about uh, trolls, and especially the ones with credit cards who buy ads in order to do their trolling. This is kind of a new, I hope this isn't a trend. I hope this is something that Twitter is going to put a stop to. But can you tell us about what is happening in the word in the world of paid trolling? Yes, uh, this is a weird and uh, hard thing to talk about. But yesterday on Twitter, a Twitter troll uh, took out a paid ad that essentially um, it told transgender people to commit suicide is what the ad said. And uh, the account was a fake. It was a troll account that was uh, imitating Caitlin, who you can see there. And uh, she's uh, someone who's been very, you know, supportive of uh, uh, transgender people and, and women and, and kind of fought back against these Internet trolls, especially on Twitter. She works for and Wired, right? Yeah. And so someone essentially was like, OK, well, we're going to uh, create this fake account and say something very, very mean and hurtful. And for some reason, it snuck past Twitter's automated uh, ad scanning system. So when people take out ads, I mean, people take out ads all the time on Twitter. So what they do is they have a, a, an automatic system that's supposed to identify and flag words that would be inappropriate. But Sorry. This ad slipped through the cracks and uh, it was removed right away. The account was suspended. But still, I mean, just the fact that a machine did not pick up on these words is pretty surprising and pretty disappointing as well. It certainly is. And it uh, it brings up a couple of interesting issues that are related to this. One is that, of course, a big part of the digital revolution, the online, the Internet revolution, whatever you want to call it, is the automa automation of things that used to be done by people. For example, years ago, there was no such thing as the ability to put ads in front of people's eyeballs without human beings looking at that ad and saying, is this what we want to do? Now there's a lot of automation. Uh, yeah, there's, there's algorithmic flagging sometimes where it's sent to a person for a person to say, hmm, this, this looks suspicious. Uh, but for the most part, these things are automated. Other examples outside of the world of advertising include recent problems with Google Maps, where there was a recent um, racial slur, which if you search for it, would bring up the White House. There was a recent uh, sort of by, by submitting different shaped parks, uh, someone was able to, and we reported on the show, uh, to create a logo, the, the Android logo urinating on the Apple logo, things mm -hmm. like that. There's a lot of that stuff going on. And the trolls and, and uh, haters and the racists and the, everybody else are figuring out that they can use the fact that nobody's watching the store, nobody's minding the gate in order to slip in their trolling and their harassment. Uh, because, again, there's no human involvement in a lot of these decisions. Uh, it, what do you suppose Twitter could do besides just hiring a thousand people and, 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 and looking at every single ad? Well, that's probably out of the question at this point, right? When, when you talk about a company like a Twitter or a Google or a Facebook that are so large, they're trying to keep their business going. They, they can't possibly, uh, yeah, have a thousand people reading every ad that goes on the, on the site. And so I guess what has to happen is you have to make sure that this technology that you're serving, you're having set up as the gatekeeper is actually working. And I don't understand how those were, I mean, the, the words from that Twitter ad that we showed, those were pretty graphic 
words, um, you know, the, the word kill alone should automatically flag some kind of um, person to have to come in and, and personally verify that that ad is a legitimate one. So I, I think it's just a matter of, hey, we need to make sure that the, the technology we're using as a gatekeeper is really up to speed. And, and a lot of this is still relatively new over the last couple of years. So I'm not trying to make excuses for anybody, but my guess is that this is going to continue to get better over time. I just don't see manual. I don't see bringing someone in to do it manually as the answer. Yeah, and it also has to be said that Twitter, once again, is at the center of a story about trolling. And uh, it's one, one of the themes that this brings up for me is something I've harped on a couple of times on the show before, which is that the net effect of trolling, it's not a, so much about the individual victims, uh, although that is problematic. It's about the larger change that it affects in the conversation and who's allowed to join the public conversation in this digital public square. And I'm going to tell you something that happened this morning. I invited a couple of people to talk about this, one of whom was a, a, a woman reporter who reported on this story. And she declined to come on the show because she said she'd already been harassed by people on Twitter because of her story. And she didn't want to, she just wants it to go away. So this is a, a literally a case in which a public person with a lot to say is being silenced because of trolls and more to the point because of Twitter's inability to deal with trolls. And over, overall, this changes who's involved in the conversation. Lots and lots of women, for example, have left Twitter or have remained silent when they otherwise would have spoken out. And this is the effect of trolling. And this is why we really have to hold Twitter's feet to the fire. It's all, almost all of these stories are about Twitter. Well, it's somewhat ironic as well in that typically the argument is that, okay, because you can contribute to the conversation anonymously, it increases people's uh, likelihood of participating in these conversations, right? They're able to say things they might not otherwise say because they're too embarrassed or, or they're afraid of uh, attaching their identity to it, but in a good way. It, of course, in this instance, it's the exact opposite. People who are hiding behind uh, an anonymous avatar are able to quiet or, or uh, keep others from participating in what should be an important dialogue. So, you know, you see this on Twitter often. It's, it's a big struggle that they're having as a company. You heard uh, CEO Dick Koslow sent out an internal memo. I think um, The Verge reported on that a couple months ago where he was basically like, we suck at dealing with internet trolls. And, and you know, you see it on Reddit as well. You see it on Facebook. You see it on all these social networks where people uh, just say mean things behind their their computers or their cell phones, and uh, yeah, it's in in Twitter's case, it's been worse than others, and it's something they got to figure out because who wants to join Twitter when when this is the public perception of what kind of happens on the service? Well, that's exactly right. It's certain types of people are fine with Twitter, and certain types of people are not, and that changes what the conversation is. I'd like to reframe this whole conversation and, and get people thinking along the following lines: There are really two kinds of social networks. They're the kind of social networks like Twitter and Reddit where you have to ask and beg and plead the company to make the decision to do something about the trolls. And then there are the other social networks like Facebook and Google Plus and others where you delete the trolls message yourself. It, it, the conversations happen within the container of the initial post. So, so, it, so a comment, I can create a community on Google Plus or Facebook where uh, where all the comments and all the these influence of troll, you know, trolls or non-trolls happen within the container of that initial message. And then as the person who posted the initial message, I can delete the message. I can block the person so they can never comment again in my communities. And somebody in the chat room said, well, this is a slippery slope to free speech. But I disagree with that. On places like Facebook and Google+, Plus, it's my profile is the one place in the whole Internet where I personally can decide for whatever criteria I want who to include, who to exclude, it's like a cocktail party. I can disinvite. If somebody uh, gets drunk and starts breaking things in my house, I don't have to invite them next time. And that's essentially what it's all about. The sites like Twitter and Reddit, I have to go and say, I convince them. And then what happens is there's an arms race. So the trolls figure out how to get around it. They're always trying to figure, they always figure out how to get by and get through the whole, you know, uh, you know, get to the point where Twitter and Reddit basically say, nah, it's not really trolling, not really threatening anybody's life or whatever, so I'll allow it. Well, it, they're still silencing people, and I think that's the, the fundamental problem. And it, it's really a problematic for, for Twitter and Reddit because they're based on free speech. They want mm -hmm. this open conversation. Some of the benefits of Reddit and Twitter are basically based on the fact that it's kind of this freewheeling uh, system. 
So it's not an easy problem to solve, and I'm not suggesting that it is, but it's, I think it's important to, and I'm sorry for pontificating, but I think it's important for people to think about social networks in, in that sense. On the one hand, you have sites where you have to ask them to, uh, you have to convince them to delete it. On the other sites, you get to delete it. So. Well, it's, the, it's really the difference between a public and a private space. Uh, Twitter and Reddit, for the most part, are public spaces. Anyone can, can chime in. Uh, Facebook and Google Plus are, for the most part, private. Um, you know, you can certainly find groups or chats or whatever to contribute to maybe a public dialogue. But for the most part, things that happen on Facebook are happening between me and the friends that I have decided uh, I want to show my profile to. So I think that's a big difference, right? Um, it's hard to have a public, open to everybody space where people aren't going to take advantage of that in a, in a really negative way. Yeah. Uh, and one other quick thing, I know we, we've spent a lot of time on this, but uh, that the theoretically is disturbing. On social networks like Twitter, uh, if trolls are going to start and haters and the rest are going to start buying ads, that's problematic because ultimately the, the advertiser is the customer. I'm not the customer unless I buy ads. So it's like I'm the product, you know, it's like an old cliche. But, uh, but if lot, you know, I, I have the feeling that there's lots of this kind of slightly more subtle, well, significantly more subtle trolling that happens in political speech uh, by, you know, by shady campaign groups and so on, uh, PACs and, and, and so on. And this has been going on for a long time. And television and social networks allow this kind of trolling because they're spending the money. They're the customer. And so I, I just hope that this kind of thing doesn't catch on. And, and I hope it's not allowed simply because, you know, uh, whoever pays for it gets to do what they want. Right. And I, I guess one last point, uh, they just, Twitter recently started allowing advertising on user profiles. Um, yeah. so not necessarily with, with those of, uh, those of Twitter's users who are verified the, there's not going to be ads on their profiles because they didn't necessarily want, uh, you know, LeBron James to be getting Adidas ads on his profile when he's sponsored by Nike. Those are, those are relationships that they don't want to have to deal with. But you can see this could be a major issue, right? Like what if uh, you log in and there's, there's an advertisement on your profile for, for something you completely disagree with? Um, and promoted tweets, as we just learned, can kind of be across this entire spectrum from brand messaging to, to people seeking jobs to people doing hate speech. So uh, that, that'll be something interesting to pay attention to kind of as that rolls out for Twitter and as we start seeing more ads on user profiles, which is kind of new. Yeah, and hopefully everybody who has ads on profiles will allow those of us whose profiles those ads are on to complain, uh, to tailor it, and so on. Uh, and hopefully not too much tailoring. I hate to basically say, I only want ads for, you know, whatever, uh, Budweiser or something like that. That would be right. weird. Well, maybe not. Who knows? Well, anyway, we've got some more news in just a sec. But first, I want to talk about how to do really great payments. One of our sponsors today, our sponsor today is Braintree. Uh, now, if you're a mobile app developer, you have to use Braintree, just like some of the most successful startups in the industry. I'm talking about Munchery, Hotel Tonight, Airbnb, and one of the biggest success stories in the last couple of years, Uber. One of the reasons Uber is so great to use, I recently discovered it, I've recently been using it, it's so simple. You just plug in, it's so straightforward. You just plug in your credit card information, and after that, you never think about the billing and payments part. You take the ride, and you get out, and it tells you how much it costs. It, it's all paid for, it's done, and that's one of the reasons that Uber is successful. Braintree is the engine that makes it so simple. And it's simple for the developer too. A little bit of code, a few minutes, and you have implemented Braintree. You can accept Apple Pay, PayPal, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, Diners Club, and a lot more. You can even accept Bitcoin. Uh, and that you can accept money in 130 currencies all over the world. And with instant approval, you can start accepting payments minutes after implementing. It's really a fantastic uh, site. You'll get up and running right away. And if you've got a tiny company, Braintree will grow with you until you're a giant company like Uber. Braintree gives you a full stack payment solution, support for all payment types for your customers. And you can start accepting PayPal, Apple Pay, Bitcoin, Venmo, credit cards, and a lot more with a single integration across all platforms. They have superior fraud protection, superior customer service, and fast payouts to learn more and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee-free, go to braintreepayments.com slash TNT. Don't forget the slash TNT part at the end. 
Well, Google is building a very low-powered operating system for the Internet of Things, which is codenamed Brillo, but may be released under the Android brand. Amir Afradi and Stephen Nellis wrote about it for The Information, and Stephen Nellis joins us to talk about it now. How are you doing, Stephen? Good, good. Thanks for having me, Mike. Thanks for being on. Now, what did your sources tell you about Google's plans for the Internet of Things exactly? Well, what we're hearing is that uh, there's an operating system in development that would be significantly lighter weight in terms of how much memory it takes. So the way things stand right now, Android is kind of optimized for devices that have at least 512 megabytes of RAM. So that's, you know, phones and tablets and actually a lot of devices around the house, too. Um, but for smaller, lower power devices, so these are things maybe that you would um, you know, put some uh, replaceable batteries in and would have a battery life of, of years, you know, smoke detectors, sound detectors, anything like that where power is kind of the critical consideration. Uh, the memory requirements just have to be much, much, much lower. Uh, and I think that, you know, Google wants to have a play here. Um, there's lots of other people trying to get into this market. Uh, Samsung just released the chipset um, and, you know, several other companies like Canonical on the open source side are trying to to mm -hmm. uh, get a, a lower level operating system here, but they all want to do it with less memory. And here's the real key. They want to do it in a way that your average kind of mobile developer understands. Uh, because a, a lot of the operating systems that power these devices today, these smaller devices with less than 500 megabytes of RAM, are custom made. So they kind of have to take a bunch of parts off the shelf and, and hobble something together. And that means that it's really difficult uh, for anybody except the team that actually made the device to kind of write software to it and to work with it with the same kind of ease that developers work with Android or iOS or Android. Too. Hey, Stephen, uh, this is Kurt. What What's the timing that you're hearing on this? How you know soon are we going to see something like this actually available? Well, they might be talking about it at next week's I.O. conference, um, but the actual release itself, uh, it's several months, um, possibly by the end of the year, is what we're hearing. So this is something that it, it's going to take some work. And it's also, we should definitely note, not entirely clear whether it will be put out under the Android brand. Um, I, I think it probably, you know, will depend on a multiple uh, variety of things, but that, that's probably not a decision yet been made from what we understand. Stephen, uh, I was at uh, Google I.O., I guess it was two or maybe three years ago, when Google made a big deal out of Android at Home. Is this a continuation of the Android at Home initiative, or is this something completely <laughs> different? Yes, yes. So that is a great question. Um, I, I think that, you know, our sources tell us that that was a little bit too early uh, and, and that it didn't quite get the, the traction that they had hoped. So whether this will represent a continuation of that or a clean break, it, it's still not quite yet clear. Um, I think, though, that this is probably more related to making things play with NEP and getting a control point in the IoT ecosystem more broadly. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, again, not even clear whether it's going to be branded as Android, even though that's kind of their most recognizable brand among developers. <laughs> There is a huge market need here for these smaller devices. And, you know, even things like the Net have 500 megabytes of RAM and run a more kind of Linux-like operating system. Uh, but there's just nothing down here at this sort of point, and that's where they're really trying to go. And one more quick question. Is this under Sundar Pichai? Is this uh, yet another Google product that he's in control of? That is another thing that we'll have to keep uh, reporting on. I mean, one of the most interesting thing here, uh, you know, is that it, as much as he's kind of taking control of a lot of products and things, uh, Tony Fidel at Net is very much the face of Google when it comes to Internet of Things. Um, you know, Google's led some other software initiatives like Thread, um, which has been, it, it's kind of complicated, but it's basically a networking protocol to get these things talking to each other a little bit better. Uh, and obviously, with Google's participation, you know, Net could be a sort of hub in that. Uh, and that has all been led by Net. Google is participating, but it's through the lens of Net. So that's another thing um, I think that we'll have to wait and see on uh, kind of where the, the locus of control ends up. All right. Well, Stephen Nellis is at theinformation.com and on Twitter at Stephen Nellis with two L's. 
Thank you so much for joining us today, Stephen. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks Kurt. A report on 9to5Max says Apple plans to release an app called Home for managing HomeKit-compatible accessories. The new Home automation app could be unveiled at Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference next month, or it might not be. The Home app is already part of OS 9 builds used by Apple employees, according to this story. And Kurt Wagner, this makes a whole lot of sense. I was kind of wondering what the interface would be for, you know, all of these rumors we've been hearing about Apple's HomeKit and the use of Apple TV as a hub for HomeKit uh, devices. Uh, and this sounds like a really straightforward uh, initiative. I I think this story has a lot uh, going for it because it just makes a lot of sense. So, uh, yeah, it totally makes a lot of sense. I mean, I use probably four different Apple devices in my home already, uh, including an Apple TV. And just this whole, you know, internet of things. I mean, we were just obviously talking about it with Google as well. This whole idea that everything's going to be connected and we're all going to be able to, to control everything that happens in our home from our smartphone. I mean, it seems as if that's inevitable and and logical that Apple would want to get in on that kind of a business. Definitely. And according to the story, uh, they're saying that the organizing principle is virtual rooms. So if you have devices in your bedroom and one in the kitchen and one in the bathroom, whatever, that's the organization that is within the app. So you can sit there and say, okay, here are the lights in the bedroom and here's the lights in the kitchen. Uh, assuming that you have those things connected. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's going to be an interesting uh, developers conference. Again, that is next month. We'll be covering it on this network. And so we'll uh, all look forward to what they announce at that uh, show. Well, the Edward Snowden trove of leaked documents is still making the news. The latest report on The Intercept says the NSA made plans to distribute malware through the, get this, Google Play Store and also the Samsung App Stores. As always, the best part of the program is its internal name. In this case, it's called Irritant Horn. For some reason, the malware enabled a man in the middle attack, enabled the NSA to get real time locations and copy users contacts right off their phones. It's unclear whether these plans were ever put into motion or whether the NSA was ever able to circumvent Google and Samsung encryption and Kurt Wagner. There were rumors that they were able to do this, but of course, it's all taking place in the shadows. It's not even clear if this ever even happened. Uh, who knows what the NSA has actually done? But one of the things they were hoping to do was uh, for example, use Google Play servers in France to deliver these malware updates to users in northern Africa, where there's a lot of terrorist activity by Al-Shabaab, etc. Pretty interesting. And, and, and again, back to the, the, the sort of the internal meta news angle, it's amazing that the, uh, these leaks are still making headlines. It is amazing, but at the same time... Uh I mean, is, are you totally surprised? I'm not totally surprised when I hear this kind of stuff anymore. I'm kind of of the mindset now that everything that happens uh, on my smartphone, somebody is probably watching. Maybe that's, I don't know, that's kind of a sad, pessimistic view perhaps. But, um, you know, you think of the, the resources that these, in this case, the U.S. government has at its disposal and this pressure that they feel to, always be ahead of what's happening on the tech front. I, I don't know. It doesn't blow my mind anymore, although it's obviously a huge invasion of privacy and it's troubling. It's not, it's not surprising. Yeah, it's absolutely not. I think, you know, the only way to really have a secure phone is to turn off the location feature, remove the battery, bury the phone, pour cement on top of it and leave the country. And hopefully by then uh, they won't be able to track you. But, you know, the NSA is very clever, and they have a huge budget, so who knows? Well, the Wall Street Journal says Google has developed new technology to show how mobile ads lead to actual sales, not online, but in brick-and-mortar stores. The ability to demonstrate this connection enables them to charge a lot more for the ads. Google has been revealing to stores like Target, Home Depot, and other giants uh, that people who have tapped on mobile search ads spend more when they go to the store than the non-tappers, and this is enabling them to charge a lot more for ads. And their, you know, early partners are saying, "Hey, this is great stuff. Uh, you know, this is really driving sales." Uh, but again, this is something that Facebook is doing as well. Kurt Wagner, do you think that either Google or Facebook has an advantage in this whole world of essentially tracking people to the store? Well, my only, I guess, if I had to to pick between the two, I would kind of lead towards Facebook, and only because I feel like people are on Facebook more when they're when they're in the physical space of the store, right? And so if you're uh, using something like maybe a, a beacon, for example, and you're pushing out an advertisement while someone's walking through Nordstrom, 
and I happen to be on Facebook while I'm walking through uh, the store on my phone, I might see that ad. I mean, this is a personal thing, right? I just don't happen to be on Google much on my on my phone. I'm on Google all day long on my laptop and not on my phone. So in that sense, I would think that kind of getting ads to people in physical stores and then kind of showing, hey, we're showing an ad on Facebook or on Google and it's actually leading to a sale, I would give a, a slight edge to Facebook, but that's really the only reason why. I mean, this is, as you pointed out, something that a lot of major uh, advertisers are trying to do. And, and Twitter's going to eventually be trying to do this as well, right? They want to show to advertisers, when you spend money on our platform, you don't just get a like or a retweet or a favorite. You're actually making sales. That's the big, that's the big thing they got to do. So you're yeah. going to see this continue to grow. And very, very big sales. One of the bombshells from the Wall Street Journal's version of this story was that Deloitte estimates that 28% of sales in physical stores, 28%, that's more than one quarter, are influenced by mobile devices. Now, that's not mobile de advertising specifically, but mobile devices. Now, the total of this 28% adds up to $970 billion. That's generally how d much money Deloitte says mobile uh, devices are influencing. Now, one of the other reasons why Facebook has an advantage over Google is that the tracking of this, the state of the art for Google is to track people through their email address. So what they do is they use cookies uh, on the mobile app advertisement and they figure out a way to associate that user with an email address that has been given to the store or to some other organization that the store have, has access to or that Google has ac to, access to. So they know people, the identity uh, hub of this identity wheel, if you will, is an email address. Whereas Facebook, they know who you are. They know your name. They know your friends. They know where you live. They know all kinds of stuff, not just an email address. So I think that they have an enormous potential advantage in this space. And again, this is a this is probably why Google launched Google Plus in the first place. Unfortunately, people don't spend all day on Google Plus like they do on Facebook. So, you know, this is, you know, people don't even think about that stuff. They think, oh, social networking, I see cat videos and talk to my, uh, you know, Aunt Mildred or whatever. No, this is all about identity and identity is all about boosting the price of advertising. Really amazing story. So yeah. I'd love and, to know more about this technology too, exactly how it works. Yeah, and, and you know, one last thing is that you mentioned internet cookies as being kind of a big part of Google's ad strategy. And with the, with the smartphones, those go out the window, right? Because there, there aren't cookies on, on mobile phones, on mobile devices. And so that's the big challenge now. And that's something that Facebook, I think, has started preparing for earlier than a lot of these other players is saying, how do we take uh, that information that you mentioned we have on, on people on Facebook, the ads we're showing them on mobile, and then translate that um, you know, based on their mobile device activity. It's not an easy thing to do, and that's why everyone is scrambling right now to figure out how to connect offline and mobile uh, activity. So it will be really interesting. I do, as, as I already said, I agree with you, though. I think Facebook might have an early edge right now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in related news, Google rolled out new ads on YouTube today that enable you to buy things directly from pre-roll ads. They call those pre-roll ads TrueView ads. From now on, some TrueView ads will show products uh, with offers and a button for buying. So just click to buy. Early partners say the ads triple the revenue of these pre-roll ads. Kurt Wagner, this is yet, you know, this is essentially the same story we just covered. They, they're using technology and new services to dramatically boost the amount that they can charge for advertising. Yeah, and I mean, this whole concept of one click to buy, uh, that's certainly taking off right now, but I would imagine that in a couple of years, almost every ad you see online is, is going to have one of those little buy buttons with it, right? I mean, why even go through the process of making you click an ad, go to another web page, sign in, do all that stuff? I think that this whole, hey, we're going to put the buy button right there so that if you see something, you like it, it's a one click experience. Um, you know, they always talk about this is, this is obviously a, a buzz term in the industry, but that whole um, removing friction, right? That's what everyone likes to say. We love to remove yeah. friction from this experience and putting the button there or the ability to buy right there is, is, I would say, the first step to doing that. And that concept of basically advertiser driven buying is in some ways, if taken to an extreme, an alternative to going to Amazon.com. I mean, this is how companies like 
Google and YouTube, Facebook and other companies, social networks in general, websites in general, can replace Amazon, the whole process of you thinking, oh, I need to buy something. I think I'll go to Amazon.com because they already have my credit card. To like you just going around the web looking at stuff and, oh, they know that I need this. Yeah, you're right. Give me that. Oh, and give me that. And in the case of, you know, and this is one of the reasons I think why Amazon has rolled out the Echo, which is they're removing friction in a different way to buying things. Now you can just talk to your living room and paper towels show up the next day. So this is another way to remove friction. Everybody's trying to remove fix friction. And, uh, you know, it's a fight for survival because whichever model wins is, of course, you know, once you can sell everybody everything, you pretty much are going to make a lot of money. Well, and you, I don't know if you saw the news. I'm sure you did last week. Uh, we haven't talked about it, but the whole uh, story, I believe it was from the journal that Google was going to have buy buttons in search results now. And, you know, that's just yet another example of bringing the, the ease of, of making a purchase to the point where people are, are actually searching for something. And, you know, I will say that if you talk to anyone in the e-commerce world, I bet they would tell you that one of the toughest things they have to deal with is getting people to hand over their credit card information that first time. Yeah. Um, not only because people are reluctant to part with that personal information, but they're, it's, a, it's like a hassle. And, it, you know, it takes time to type in the numbers and, and, and do the expiration date and all that. But once it's in there, I mean, I use my credit card at coffee shops all over San Francisco. And it's sweet because... Almost everyone uses Square, and my email's in Square, and I just get the receipt emailed to me right away at this point. So it's like once you finally put, take the time to put your info in, it's a great experience, but getting past that initial hurdle is, is I think, what uh, a lot of commerce people are struggling with right now. So the more that they can, I guess, loop people in early on, and then they realize, oh, this is a pretty smooth experience. That's that's going to benefit them down the road. That's an advantage Amazon has had for a long time. And also Apple. Apple probably has more credit cards than anybody else. But they don't sell everything. They they have no. some content and some apps and so on. Um, but Amazon, you know, uh, probably millions of people a month will go to a site and it's a catalog site of some kind. They're going to buy something and like, oh, okay, now they, they need my address. And they need this and that, mm -hmm. the credit card number. And I need to put in the little three-digit number on the back of the card. And I'll forget it. I'll just go to Amazon.com and buy the same thing from Amazon. The huge advantage for Amazon is exactly what you're saying. This is one of the advantages of, of things like, you know, Apple and Google and Samsung and others having these payment solutions. If you're using Apple Pay or you know, if you had been using Google Wallet or you using what uh, the, all these companies are doing to uh, facilitate payment, it's not just facilitation of payment. It's like, give me your credit card. Because once we have your credit card, we can do, we can make things super easy for you. Right. Uh, and we'll get a, a penny for that transaction or whatever it is. So, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, you're absolutely right. And it's going to get to the point where people will essentially refuse to enter their credit card anymore. It's a, it's a game of musical chairs and the music is about to stop. And I think people are just going to be fed up with, with that old-fashioned uh, uh, practice of having to put in a credit card every time you want to buy something. Right. And there's a battle right now going on between companies like Stripe and Square and Braintree, Venmo. I, those, those are owned, both owned by uh, PayPal. But you get the idea is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who want to own your information so that they can be that automated service that you use. And... Uh, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see who kind of comes out on top there. But, um, the, you know, throw Apple in the mix with Apple Pay, too. And, and you've got a pretty interesting commerce situation going on right now in the tech space. You definitely do. Well, a trivia app called QuizUp is pivoting into a game-centric social network. The app is rolling out profile pages, following, and other social features. They're also launching a desktop browser version. Now, I was really skeptical. I thought, this is dumb. It's a, it's a trivia <laughs> app that wants to be a social network. But... This video won me over and made me want to join. And check this out. Beyonce. Test me on my Beyonce. No, in fact, don't test me because it wouldn't be fair to you. Like it wouldn't be fair to this guy. Bring it. Quiz Up matches you up in real time with worthy Beyonce opponents all over the world. Ah! Yeah, I don't know about Beyonce, but. I crushed him. Made him feel bad about how dumb he is. I challenged him to a rematch. Lost again. Felt bad about how dumb I am. But I messaged him through the app, made friendly with him, built him back up a bit. Turns out he's pretty cool. Turns out you can actually make friends with people in the same stuff as you. Who knew? That's how I met this nice lady. Hey. See if there's three things I know in this world. It's Beyonce, neuroscience, and my little pony. 
I have a pretty strong presence on the My Little Pony feed and quiz up. I post gifts from the show, quotes about friendship, anything that inspires me and my friends. And I brag about winning games. The only person who's ever beat me is this guy. Friendship is magic. <laughs> but I figure we have so much in common, there's gotta be something there. So we started talking through quiz up, whatever. Long story short, we're basically in love now. And I have a new friend who knows the truth and beauty in Queen Bee. And I'm a global leader in a community of like-minded individuals <laughs> who accept me as I am. And now I'm the number one Game of Thrones player in the world. Come at me. All right, so the basic idea here is, of course, social networks like Google Plus and Reddit and others bring people together. I guess, I guess I don't know if Reddit is a social network. Oh, let's call it a social ne social network. Why not? Uh, they bring people together around their interests. And Quiz Up is essentially discovered that when people have these sort of quiz battles over their passions, they're essentially creating community uh, around these interest areas. And I think that's kind of brilliant, actually. And uh, I think that the, you know, quiz up is something that uh, I'm going to join and give it a try and just see what happens. Uh, it sounds like they're on the right track. And it just sounds fascinating to me. Uh, Kurt Wagner is, uh, did, did, were you won over by that video? Uh, uh, or do you think uh, you've had enough social networks uh, already? Uh, man, I mean, I get pitched social networks every single day, as you can imagine, given that it's my, my B yeah. here, B code. So for me, I, I did find the video entertaining. I wasn't won over. However, um, I think that I've, I've, I've spread thin enough on the social network front. That being said, why not? I mean, if you can build the technology in there, there are going to be some people who love to banter back and forth, create a little bit of a community. There's no downside to doing it. I just don't know if uh, it's something that I'm necessarily going to spend a lot of time uh, on myself. Yeah, well, good luck to quiz up. Uh, it's a nice effort, an interesting pivot. I didn't see it coming. Uh, so we'll see how that goes, and we'll report back if anything happens on that front. Well, we've got some big numbers for you. 18.7 million. That's how many smartphones China's Lenovo shipped in the fourth quarter of last year, a record for the company. And this included 7.8 million phones from its recently acquired Motorola division. All right, another big number, 37. That's how many percentage points Lenovo's profits declined in Q4 compared to the same quarter in the previous year. Now, we, we could have made a big, big story out of this because Lenovo's uh, report was actually very complex. They were acquiring a lot of things, changing a lot of things. They're, they're a company in flux, uh, but suffice it to say that they are doing pretty well, as usual. And uh, also, interestingly, they're getting a lot more juice from their smartphone division than their PC division. Of course, Lenovo is traditionally a PC company that years ago bought the IBM ThinkPad line. And uh, they have a good reputation for their products, both on the PC side and the smartphone side. So really interesting to watch them and see how they do. Profits are down, but I think they're going to. I think they're going to be just fine. Well, in news you can lose, Delta Airlines created a new in-flight safety video crammed with internet memes. Let's <laughs> check this out. Welcome aboard, and thanks for flying with Delta. Our first priority on every flight is safety. So before we depart, I'll be giving a brief safety presentation. Okay. Be sure all carry Double rainbow items guy are putting rainbows in the, in the overhead, overhead compartment. Bin. And it's a real guy. These are the real under the seat internet in front of stars. You. There's the so demeaning. talking orange. And ensure all owls, exits, and bulkhead areas are clear. Cat on a Roomba wearing if a If you're seated at an emergency costume. exit, please review the responsibilities for emergency exit seating on the back of the safety information card, which is in your seat pocket. Are you willing and able to Gosh, assist with the operation of the exit if necessary? Yes. No. Okay, the seat next to her is getting up If you're up and unable leaving. to perform these functions, please let us know, and we'd be happy to find you another seat. I don't yes. know who that guy is. As we leave the gate, make sure your seatbelt is fastened. To fasten, insert the metal tip into All right, the buckle. This is the history of dance the guy. So it's low and tight uh, your dancing so while putting on a. Just lift the top right, you get the, the idea. They have like dozens, uh, or maybe even a hundred, <laughs> internet memes in this thing. It's hilarious, and I, I think they're actually going to play this on flights, right? I mean, why not? It's a real safety video. Uh, <laughs> did you recognize all these, Kurt, or...? or, or no, I'm, I'm actually glad you were pointing them out as we went along, because uh, I didn't recognize them. Have you seen 
You know who else does this is Virgin uh -huh. America. Have you been on have you been on one of their flights recently? I haven't, but I've seen some of their videos on YouTube. Yeah, they do a they do a video like this, um, but it's more of like a music video style. And I have to say, when I first saw it, I, you know, did the whole rolled my eyes. I can't believe what is this? Oh my gosh. And now I actually uh, find myself like tapping my foot along with it. Um, it's it's kind of catchy. And, you know, as someone who's flown a number of times and at this point kind of, I hate to say, tunes out the uh, the flight attendants as they go through this, the Virgin one actually catches my attention still. So I guess that's the point, right? Get people's attention. Yeah, there was a there was one that uh, was made famous because the um, the safety video involved a uh, a flight attendant who was very like kind of bossy and shaking her finger in front of the camera, saying, "No, no, no, you can't do that." And they they have actually have her on this flight telling a goat that uh, the goat can't smoke a cigarette, and so the <laughs> the goat screams. It's one of the highlights of this. There's the squirrel. The all right. Well, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I enjoyed I it. I you to check, check out the Virgin one. It's yeah. a little, with the music, it adds a little, uh, it's more upbeat, yeah. let's say. <laughs> it's a great idea. Actually getting Kurt Wagner's attention uh, for yes. the safety video. That's what it takes. Well, our TNT fan of the day is Hologram Software CTO Dennis Opel, who posted this picture on Twitter yesterday. It shows yesterday's co-anchor, Christina Bonington, through virtual reality goggles. <laughs> There, she's virtually there. She's virtually right in front of you. Now, if you look closely at that, this is a movie theater. So this is a, this is how we'll watch regular YouTube videos in the future, I guess. We'll be in a 3D virtual reality movie theater and uh, watching it on the screen. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Kurt Wagner, what are you working on right now and where can people read it? Oh, wow. Well, uh, I'm always working on stuff uh, in the social space, and you can read all my work and the work of my colleagues at recode.net. But we have our big conference next week. Mike, I don't know if you are familiar with the Code Conference, oh, but yeah. it kicks off uh, Tuesday. So the staff's going to be down in the L.A. area next week, which we're all very excited about. As seen on the HBO hit series Silicon Valley. I might as, seen, as seen on HBO, yes. Yeah, yeah. And you can follow Kurt Wagner at Kurt Wagner 8 on Twitter. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kurt. We'll see you next time. Of course. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Bye. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on Spotify. Check it out. You can choose your favorite way to subscribe, twit.tv slash TNT. You can also watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv or on the app or browser plug in your choice. You can make that choice at twit.tv slash apps. If you're going to be in town next week for Google I.O., come on up and watch us as part of our studio audience. Just send email to tickets at twit.tv before you come in. If you'd like to help us grow our audience, here's how you can do it. Just post a link to twit.tv slash TNT on your favorite social media site, tag three friends, recommend that they subscribe, and give us a boost. We love to have as many people as we can watching our shows. Now follow us on Twitter, Tech News Today TV, and join our Google Plus community. We're having a lot of fun there. You can also follow me personally on TuneIn. Just go to TuneIn.com slash user slash Mike Elgin. Also, don't miss Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific, tonight and every single weeknight. That is the Tech News Today. The show was produced by Jason Cleanthes, Cleanthes and edited and technical directed by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.